Chicago FBC Christmas Youth Outreach. This year, in lieu of the Angel Tree, we will host our FOFBC Christmas Youth Outreach. If you know of a family who needs assistance in providing Christmas gifts to their youth and their family, please contact our church secretary, Beverly Hatchett, or myself. Um, with the, the family and the child's name and contact information. We need this information today. You may also contribute online. New Year's Eve service will be held Friday, December 31st via Zoom from 11 p.m. to 12.10 a.m. FOFBC scholarship donations. Please support our future. Our FOFBC scholarship donations are greatly appreciated. January announcements are due next Sunday, uh, December the 26th. I have a thank you card to Fountain of Faith. I would like to thank each of you for your prayers, support, encouragement, and wisdom. This year has been an emotional roller coaster for my family and I. I thank you for helping my family get through the passing of my mother, the birth of Liam, and pushing me to graduate with my master's in nursing. Again, thank you so much, Cassandra King. this Christmas season, all of us should have a song in our heart. The psalmist said in that very same Psalm 118 verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my deliverance and God is still in the delivering business. So we want to thank him for that. But on this Christmas season, on this period of time in the week as we march toward Christmas Day, it's important to understand what's most important in our lives. So I have as a topic today, uh, if you repeat after me, unwrapping, unwrapping the meaning of the meaning of heaven's gift. Heaven's gift. Unwrapping the meaning of heaven's gift is so important that we understand what the most precious gift in the world is. And as you look at your handout, you see the beautifully wrapped a red a gift below our uh, topic, and it, it, it's a verse below it. It's from James one. And uh, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. But also, I want you to be mindful of 2 Corinthians 9 and 15 that says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable or unspeakable gift. We need to really understand the most precious gift that we've ever been given. You know, we're at this time of season when we all know the Bible tells us it's more blessed to give than to receive. We love to quote that, but very few of us actually employ that in our lives. However, at this time of year, in the midst of all our giving and receiving, even the biggest Scrooge among us likes to receive a gift. I, I was blessed this past week, you know, by people just had, they had a spirit of giving. Uh, the truck didn't start, I was on my way to work Tuesday morning, I stopped in the ship of donuts to give me some coffee and donuts before I continued on to the highway. I got in the truck, my truck said, see if you can start, we're going to see who wins. So I couldn't start my truck, I tried to get two or three jumps, people stopped by, said they were willing to give me a jump, still wouldn't start. Had the tow truck driver stopped by and told me, don't, don't get a jump, you'll just mess up your, 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 your little circuits on that. He just wanted to tow my truck, so I know he, he didn't mean me no good. So I said, that's all right, sir, I'm going to try on that. My wife bought some cables, said, maybe it's my cables, wasted money on cables, that wasn't my cable. So I had my truck towed. Truck towed over there by where I live, another 10, 15 miles. But the guy, the mechanic that owned the shop, uh, he said, I, he said, I, I said, I got no car shield. I said, I'm covered. You know, whatever it is, just let me know. And so I wasn't worried about the cost. He called me back about, uh, oh, 20 minutes later. He said, Mr. Kane, I found out what's wrong with the truck. I said, what? He said, a fuse that goes to your fuel filter. It's all burned up. He said, I'll replace it. Come on, get your truck. I said, OK, uh, how much that'll be? He said, well, just pay me for the towing. I said, excuse me? It's just paper for the tow. It's paper for the tow. Don't worry about that. It's good to know you can find an honest man in 20 and 21. Amen. 20 and 21. I said, you sure, Mr. T? He said, yes. So my wife and I, we put together a Christmas card and gave him a little money to let him know we appreciate that. So, so this is the season of giving. 
when you realize how blessed you are. And he didn't have to do that, because I know if I had to take me to a shop just a half a mile from my house, they would charge me triple. Yeah. Triple than what it was and would have lied about what was wrong with my vehicle. I already know that. Yeah. So God is still in the blessed business. That's why it's better to give than receive. So give God what is due him so he didn't want to take away from you. Yeah. When you owe him anyway. And so this is the year, the time that we are in the giving of spirit. For many, one of the best parts of receiving a gift is even the anticipation or the excitement that accompanies the unwrapping uh, that particular gift. And that's what we want to do today. We want to unwrap this gift that the Father has given us. This gift is a person called Jesus Christ. We want you to understand why he came and why the Father gave him to us. And so even when we receive our little earthly gifts, you know, to tell the truth, we're thinking about, I wonder what the gift is. Uh, I wonder if the gift is what I want. And, and if it's not what I want, I hope I'm going to be disappointed and they won't see my disappointment on my face. Y'all, if you're not feeling that way now, you know you felt that way before. And hopefully we'll pass that selfishness about receiving Christmas gifts just to bless ourselves. Nothing that you or I will ever receive can match the gift that God has already given us in His Son, Jesus Christ. And I just shared with you that particular verse in 2 Corinthians 9.15. Thanks be to God for His unspeakable or His indescribable gift. Uh, he's taking care of eternity for each and every one of us that has accepted Christ as our personal Savior. No gift we'll receive uh, today or in the future can compare to that. Uh, so God is telling us something about this gift he gave us. He, he said that the gift uh, that God has given us, Paul told us in that verse in 2 Corinthians, uh, was a gift that he gave not only to us but to the entire world. And this gift is beyond description. Uh, we don't have the proper adjectives to really convey what God has done on our behalf. Yes. He gave us his son so that this world would no longer have to worry about uh, being dominated by sin and headed to hell uh, for all eternity. Because the scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And it's only free because of the price that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ paid. So in this passage we're going to look at today, Paul writes about the great unspeakable gift of God. Paul is going to help us to understand who Jesus is and why he came. Uh, his, his mission, his ministry and the message that he wanted to convey. So in effect, uh, he helps us to unwrap uh, heaven's gift to the world. You know, I love that quote that says, from his first cry in Bethlehem's manger to his last cry on Calvary's cross, he gave us the gift of his undying love. And that's the Savior that we are going to study about today. I have in your handout today uh, our passage that we'll be reading from, but before we do that, I want to share with you this, uh, this uh, acronym or HANKRONYM that is on your paper. Uh, some of you are familiar with Hank Hanegraaff. He's called the Answer Bible Man, for those of you who've never heard this program or read any of his material. He's well known for his teaching methods and using acronyms, and I love to use acronyms to teach. For example, the word GRACE, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Or when you think about your, your duty on a daily basis, when you drink your daily coffee, C-O-F-F-E-E, -E -E, Christ offers forgiveness for everyone everywhere. That way you can remember what your daily duty is to make sure you reach out to people. And so Hank has an acronym for the word Christmas. So we'll just go through that. You see, uh, for the word Christmas, to the C stands for the person who alone gives Christmas eternal significance. Christ our Savior and Lord. This is the reason for the season. Let us not be distracted by all of the, uh, the nice, uh, smart, witty uh, commercials that you see on TV every day that are appealing to our flesh and to our lust that we are absent of something and we need to buy this or we need to buy that. Uh, what we need has already been bought by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we need to thank God for that. The H stands for history regarding the season that we're in, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're not myths or fantasies, but they are realities. Uh, you can go to the history books, or you can just go to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, chapter, verses 3 uh, and 4, and that's where you'll find the gospel, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, uh, that he lived 33 years, and, and that he was crucified for our sins. He died and rose again three days later, and then he ascended to heaven, leaving the door open for you and I. Uh, there's the R, 
It's something that we should rejoice about, but Jesus has taught us. Uh, for rejoice, Christmas songs demonstrate, as we sung this morning, uh, demonstrate that rejoicing has always been a focal point of Christmas. You should already have a song in your heart. Think about how, how good God has been to you. You know, I, you know, I love this time of year. I may break out in the song before the day is over with. But you know, God rest ye merry gentlemen. We have much uh, to be excited about what God has done for us. Then there's the I. It stands for incarnation. If you don't know what that means, that's a little theological word that means deity took on humanity. Uh, because deity cannot die on the cross. It took a human body. But it had to be a human body that was not contaminated by sin. And that's why Joseph did not know Mary. Oh, it's power packed. Uh, incarnation, a word that describes the glorious event in which God became man. Then there's the S, stands for St. Nicholas. You say, well, somehow, how does St. Nicholas get, 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 get into all this word Christmas? You know, it goes back to some tradition back in one of the foreign countries when they saw the tradition about a, a man that was so married that he wanted to give gifts to people. It says the fourth century, Bishop Myra, whose life exemplifies faithfulness and charity. As I just explained to you before, just this, this week, people were willing to, to help me with my vehicle. Uh, uh, you know, I even had, had men and women to come up willing to give me a, a boost. And they just have this sense of joy and thinking about how good God has blessed them over the years. So that's where that comes into Christmas. Then there's the chief. There's the tradition. Many traditions were developed as reminders of Christ and why his gift and why he is a gift from God. You know, and you know, the, the, the deal is, really, Christmas, when our Lord was born, he was probably born during the spring. Because it says the shepherds were out feeding their flocks. They were not there at zero degrees temperature, but it was moved to this particular day in order to shine light on the Christian faith. It was used to this time, it was moved to this time of year to shine light on the Christmas faith. Sort of like our actual uh, anniversary is in May, but we celebrate it in July to make it more convenient for our members to attend. Moving now to M. It stands for Magi, uh, those three wise men, or the wise men, actually there were more than three, just so you know, uh, who served as a timeless reminder that no one is too wealthy, too wise, or worldly for God's grace. No one is too wealthy, too wise, or too worldly for God's grace. God sheds his grace on all. The A stands for Advent, the word Advent means coming. A word referring to Christ's coming from the Latin uh, Adventus means coming. His first coming is when he was born a babe in a manger. Second coming when he comes to rule the entire world. Not the rapture, but when he comes to set his feet down on this earth after uh, uh, the tribulation and rule a thousand years right on into eternity. Then there is S. Stands for salvation. The gospel story is a simple yet profound story. Not about religion, but a personal relationship with God. The Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. It's so important that you understand what John 14 and 6 is saying. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. That's what Christmas is about. Christmas was a rescue mission. Never forget that Christmas was a rescue. Yeah, enjoy yourself, enjoy your Warsaw and your cocoa, and it's good to have fun with friends, but never forget the reason for the season. It's what God wants us to understand. So, we all be in unison, make sure you're still with me. We're going to read in unison together uh, the passage to the far left, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. Let's all begin with, but when, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Amen. May God have a blessing to the hearers and doers of his holy word. So to the far right, it's trying to illustrate to you, God came to set us free. He came to deliver us from the slave market of sin. Every human being is born in the slave market of sin. Because we're contaminated by the sin of Adam. When he committed it, all of his offspring were born in sin. And so God allowed his son to be born without sin so that we might live again. So, as we begin our passage today, we're going to look at uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the gift from the Father. But he came on a mission. He also came with a ministry and he came with a message that we need to appreciate. 
If you have your Bibles today, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, let us look at our first outline, looking at the mission of heaven's gift. The, the mission of heaven's gift. What are we talking about here? Well, that particular mission, uh, 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 the, the writer Paul tries to make it abundantly clear uh, why the Savior came and why he came to bless us, that we would have to be held hostage again by Satan and by the world. And because he came, he wanted to make sure that we understood what that particular mission was. So we're in Galatians 4. You can just look at your hand out there. But I'm reading from New American Standard. It says, but when the fullness of time, when the, when, the, when the perfect time, the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman. We talked about how he used the perfect vessel in Mary in terms of he used her, her, her because she was prepared to receive this awesome privilege. Not because she merited it, but because he wanted to use that particular person to have a heart for God's word. Uh, born under the law. Born under the law. No one could keep the law, and that's why Jesus Christ came, we know. So that he might redeem, he might buy back, uh, he may purchase and set free. Those who were under the law. Those who couldn't measure up because we are born in sin. That we might receive the adoption of sons. Christmas was a rescue mission. Talking about unwrapping the meaning of heaven's gift. And so when you look at that particular passage, there are some things going on with this mission. We see the origin of the mission, we see the objective of this mission, and we will see the outcome of our Lord's mission. So as you stay right there, verses 4 uh, and 5, uh, his mission was conceived in heaven and carried out on earth. You need to understand that God thought about you and I before the foundations of the world. He called us out before the foundations of the world. So contrary to popular belief, Jesus Christ did not have his beginning in Bethlehem. Uh, you know what it said in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. And so uh, uh, his, his mission was conceived in heaven and carried out on earth. He was born in Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem means house of bread. Now, isn't it interesting that the bread of life was born in the house of bread? God has a sense of humor, doesn't it? And he was born in Bethlehem, an infant, but he has been around for all eternity. You recall what they called him? He's called the Great I Am. He is the agent behind creation itself. You know, uh, and Colossians 1.16 says we are created by God for God. And sometimes we have a, a tendency to forget the God that we serve. Uh, I bet if you had a conversation with uh, Michael Strahan today, he would tell you it's a mighty God we serve. We're talking about the God that created the universe. Uh, the God that no one can be compared to. There's no one like him. So maybe if I read that, the beginning of that verse, maybe you would understand a little bit better. Uh, in Colossians 1 and 16 it says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. That's the God we serve. As he lay as a babe in the manger in Bethlehem, he was still holding the world and the earth upon his axis. That's the God we're talking about today, the God-man, uh, unique person of the universe. There's only one true celebrity in this life, and that's Jesus Christ. These other celebrities, wherever you pick them from, uh, from industry, business industries, or from sports, they grow old, they get tired, and they die. We're talking about a celebrity that never dies and never grows old. So we're talking about the origin of his mission uh, that was put together in eternity past. And so God is trying to uh, reveal to us the time that this mission was put in place, when he came, if you'd be so kind and note in verse 4, it says he came in in the fullness of time. Underline that. What does it mean when it says the fullness of time? He came at the right time. He came at the right time religiously. He came at the right time culturally. And he came at the right time politically. And it doesn't matter what's going on in our world right now. It's still the right time to serve God. It's still the right time to tell others about the only Savior for mankind. And so during the time in which he came, religiously, the Jews were free from idolatry at that time, and they began to worship God again. They took an interest in the Messiah again. You know, that had been a 400-year gap of darkness. You know, you know, the period of the judges and going forward, people did what was right in their own eyes. And now, as they are under Roman oppression, they have a heart for God again. And so he came at the right time religiously when uh, they were trying to point people toward uh, the Old Testament tell them about the Word of God. Now, even the Old Testament, it had been completed at that time, but they now have a thirst or hunger for the prophecy of the Savior that is to come. And we were just talking about that this morning in our Sunday school lesson, 
You see, uh, they were in a period of desperation now, so they had a longing for God. The reason many people don't see God right now, things are too good for them. Things are going too well. You know, we live in America now. You can complain about all the things you don't like, but you still got a bed to lay in, you got a house to go to, you got transportation to and fro, and so you need to take it care of. But the problem is, God said, you're not desperate enough for me right now. So that's why I have to invoke these things like plagues. That's why I have to invoke these things like wars. I, I have to put you in a position where you are so desperate, and then you finally fall out to me. Maybe you got too much money in the bank account right now. Maybe your health is too good right now. You're not desperate for me right now. And so I have to put a little uh, emphasis on why you need the source of every resource. But it was a good time for them during that time religiously and culturally. Uh, the, the, the common language during that time was Koine Greek. And people pretty much used the same language during that time. And the Romans took over and they uh, commanded people to either speak in Greek or, or in this particular Latin. So everybody understood one another. It was also culturally the right time. Uh, everybody understood commonly what was going on, but also politically, it was the right time. You say, well, how could it have been the right time politically? Because Rome dominated power then, and there weren't any really the people challenging the Roman Empire, and, and the Romans allowed the Christians to uh, have religious services during that particular, or we'll say the Jews had religious services during that time, and so they could get the word out. And the Romans were so uh, uh, astute at building roads and what have you, so they were able to use the Roman roads to get the word out. So everything had been put in place for God to get his word out. Regardless of what man was doing, God was working through that. What do we say in Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good for those who love God and those who have been called according to his purpose. So it doesn't matter what's going on in the time in which you're living. It's always a good time to praise and herald God. So, we look at the origin of the mission. Let's look at our Lord's objective in verse 5. He, he pretty much touches on that a little bit more. His objective was pure, and his objective was righteous, uh, so that he might redeem. Let me line the word redeem. Christmas is about redemption. It's about rescue, and the rescue involves our being redeemed, uh, purchased uh, from Satan's power. So, let us be mindful. It says, redeem them that were under the law. Uh, the word redeem is important. You, you should be familiar with it by now. It means to buy in the slave market through the payment of the redemption price. Or to buy for oneself and then forever remove from sale. He took us off the slave market block and he removed us from sale for all eternity. What am I saying? The moment you accept Christ, you're saved for all eternity. You don't have to worry about being dominated by Satan again unless you choose to. You don't have to worry about losing your eternal life. For Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, after you've been saved, it's left up to you whether or not you allow yourself to be led astray by Satan and his false teachers. So Jesus Christ came to the world for one purpose, to die for the sins of humanity. Christmas was a rescue mission. I can't say it enough. Uh, this was clear uh, in the sole statement given by our Lord in Luke 19 and 10. He said he came to seek and save those who are lost. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. And we always celebrate on first Sunday in our communion service uh, the, the prophecy of Isaiah talking about the coming of the suffering servant, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So be mindful of the fact that he did not come to the world just to be a great teacher and a leader of men. And he didn't come simply to be an example of people. He came to give his life for a ransom of many. So, so it's important to understand what his objective was and thank God for his outcome because he was successful. He was successful, so says the word of God. So if we look at his outcome, he paid that price that we could not pay. He went to the cross, died for our sins. He said on the cross, tell us now, it is finished. Paid in full, in other words. There's nothing you can add to or take away what God has already done. You can try to be as good as you can possibly be, but it will never be good enough. You have to depend on what God has already provided. That's why it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we need to come to the agreement with, uh, that what God did for us is sufficient. It is more than enough to take care of us for all eternity. His mission was marked by his sacrificial love for you and for me. For you and for me. We're talking about how to unwrap heaven's gift. Heaven's indescribable gift. And 
so uh, God is saying, I just want you to appreciate what my son has already done, and then I want to see some proof uh, that you're willing to tell others about. We move to our second outline, verses 4 and 5 again, and he really reveals uh, uh, his, his, his ministry. And when you see the word ministry, ministry is a word that means uh, it has to do with, with his influence, why he was here on earth. It, it also talks about the ingredients that he used, the, the building blocks that he uh, utilized while he was here. He kept it simple. And what God is telling us here, he, he wants you to know that his ministry was personal. He didn't come here to save the group. He came to save the individual. You don't come to Christ as a family. You come to Christ alone. I don't care how many people you got in your family, you got to accept him for yourself. Because grandma accepted him, mama, auntie, that won't help you get to heaven. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. So his ministry was personal. Also, his ministry was peculiar in the fact that it was remarkable. Uh, it was like no other, and his ministry was powerful. Uh, to see a sinner saved is a, is a miraculous thing to witness. God found a way uh, through his love and his grace uh, to allow us to be saved without compromising his justice. That's a miracle in itself. And so when we look at his personal ministry, uh, God is saying now, uh, 5 and 7 talks about some things that make you think that what he's done for us was personal. You'll see these personal pronouns like we, like ye, like your and thou. Uh, these are personal pronouns. He, he did things for us. We, ye, our. Uh, he said, now I'm doing something for you personally. This lets us know that uh, this is the truth of heaven's gift. It is what? It's personal in nature. It's always personal in nature. Your service uh, to God, your, your thanksgiving to God is always personal in nature first. And then it spreads out to others. This is what he did for people and this is what he did for you. Uh, his ministry is always personal. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. We love to use that old cliche. But the question is, how personal really is it for you? Do you pursue the presence of God on a daily basis? Do you long to be in his presence? Do you long to know that he's walking with you? Do you long to know that he's leading you and guiding you by means of his spirit? He knew that you would accept him on whatever your salvation day was. You may not remember the exact day, time, month. Uh, you may not even remember the season. But you know he came personally for you. And when you accepted him, that was a personal moment for you. We all should be able to at least picture the, 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 the time period or the circumstances when we accepted Christ as our personal Savior at that time. And I'm willing to bet it was a time when you couldn't do no more for yourself. You said you finally said, Lord, I, I turn it over to you. I realize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Uh, the burden is too heavy for me to bear. I have a great need and I realize you're a great Christ. And so, God, I'm turning it over to you. I, I accept your son as, 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 as my Savior, and I accept his work on the cross for my deliverance. I, I thank you. But we all should be able to realize and, and, and agree that it was a personal ministry. And because that ministry was personal, your testimony needs to be personal. It needs to be, you don't need a seminar to go witness to people. You just tell people what Jesus Christ has done for you. So what's holding us back from telling somebody else about Christ? Why are we being quiet? You're quiet. We hear people say all the time, I'm a Christian too. My, my faith is just personal. I'll keep it to myself. Well, you're not helping the Lord out. Nor are you helping the cause of the church out. Our theme for the year is proclaiming confidence in the cross of Jesus Christ. We're going to proclaim it because we know what he's done for us personally. And we can't keep it to ourselves. It's like a fire burning on the inside. We've got to tell somebody because we know how good it is and we know how beneficial it is. And so his ministry was personal. When we're talking about heaven's gift, always be mindful of that. There's no such thing as limited atonement. He died for all mankind. We just decide whether or not we want to accept it or reject it. Talking about his ministry being peculiar. What I mean by that, it's a remarkable ministry. It was an extraordinary thing that he did for us. Jesus did what no other person could do. He did something that no one has ever done since then. Any of the billions of people who have ever lived could have been nailed to the cross, and not a single sin would have been paid for, not even at all. You could be the richest man in the world, and have gone to the cross, say, I'm going to die for everybody else. But it wouldn't have been good enough, because that person himself was contaminated by sin. Uh, whether it be a mental attitude sin, sin or a tongue or work sin, they were contaminated by sin, not good enough. The only person that was righteous enough to go to the cross to die for our sins was the God man, Jesus Christ. Why did he have to do it? Because Jesus did not die on the cross and they took him, taking on human.
humanity and being obedient to the Father right up to the cross until he was imputed with thousands, billions, trillions of sins of all humanity. So that what made his ministry so peculiar. Because he was different, different than any man that had ever lived before or has ever lived since. Because he was sinless. He was God in flesh. Uh, what the scripture tells us, he did something that could never be duplicated ever again. That's what's important about this Christmas that we're celebrating. That's what's important about his ministry. And then it was also powerful. Well, you've probably already guessed that by now, as you see what he, he's been able to accomplish. It goes on to tell us that he delivered us in verse 5, uh, uh, because we were under the law. We were under the oppression of trying to live up to righteousness when there's no righteousness in us. How can you live up to something that's not in you? But by the grace of God, he gave us his credit card. He gave us his righteousness. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 5.21? It says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might obtain and be credited with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, at the moment you accept Jesus Christ, he imputes to you his righteousness. And so when the Father looks down, he looks inside your soul, he doesn't see your sin, it's already been paid for, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he says, justified, you are authorized to live with us for all each other. That's something to be excited about. That's a powerful ministry. And so when we look at that, these two great things that he accomplished for you and for me, number one, he delivered us from the authority of a law that we could never keep. He delivered us from the authority of a law that we could never keep. Uh, because James says in 2.10, if we were to try to keep the law, and we stumbled at any point out us to the place uh, of being in his family. Now we consider it to be family of God, but the church is called, church age is called the royal family of God. That's something that we can be excited about. That's something that we can share with others. That's something that no one else could ever do. So, so contrary to popular opinion, we can never merit salvation. See, salvation is not for those uh, that deserve it. Salvation is for the guilty. We are all are considered guilty before God because we can never measure up. But God in his grace and mercy found a way out of no way to make a way for each and every one of us. That's something we need to be grateful for. So we're talking about unwrapping the meaning of heaven's gift. This is what we're talking about when it says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. He's already done more for us than anyone could ever do. Romans 8, 32, he that spared not his own son. People, how can he not with him freely give us all things? Whatever has you burdened down this Christmas season, whatever you're looking back on, God has already made provision for you to make it through that. And God is saying, if you just trust me, like in our Sunday school lesson, he told Simeon, if you just believe my promise, I will allow you to encounter something you never thought possible. I'll allow you to stay alive long enough to see the Messiah. I, 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 you won't leave this earth until I keep my promise to you. And God is not a man that he should lie. God has never made a promise too good to be true. So God is saying, whatever is bearing you down, God says, you just hold on because your rescue is on the way. Moving to our last outline, we see the message. Oh, he had a message when he came. He had a message when he came. He didn't just come here to exist. We all have a message to give. Uh, now that we're saved, God didn't expect us to just uh, rest on our laurels or uh, go about our daily lives and forget about him. Uh, our Savior had a message to give. Where was that message coming from? It was a message about the Father, that the Father loves us. The greatest love letter you ever read in the Bible is found in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is a lover. God is a giver. God is a savior. And we're talking about acronyms today. Don't forget that acronym. Believe, B-E-L-I-E-V-E, -E -E, because Emmanuel lives, I expect victory every time. That, and that acronym of believe, because he, we don't serve a dead God. We serve a resurrected Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father and he is our advocate, he is our, he is our divine attorney. When Satan tries to come before the, he's still allowed to come before the throne of grace and he tries to accuse you or me of a sin or a crime, and Jesus Christ steps in as our attorney and says, Father, Dad, I took care of that on the cross for that. Uh, I, I, I've already paid for that. That's null and void, what he's bringing up. So don't you worry about what is pressing you down or keeping you down. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
has already come to our defense. So when we get to these last two verses, it's important uh, when we're able to call the Father Daddy or Abba because of our relationship through Jesus Christ. Verse 6 and 7, it says, Because you are underlined sons, that means sons or daughters, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. What's the Spirit of His Son? The Holy Spirit. Into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Yes, it's personal. Yes, he's family. Therefore, you're no longer a slave that you see to the right. Uh, so what God is saying, now once I deliver you, please, Christian, don't play with the chains. After I have unshackled you, don't go around and play with the chains. Don't go back to the place that I delivered you from. Don't go back to the sin that was holding you back, that separates you from me. Uh, people may not be able to see it, but God says, I check the mind daily. And I will bless or curse you according to your thoughts and your deeds. And so he has a message about the Father. Remember who you belong to now. Underline that phrase, Abba, Father. Uh, so, so it could be roughly translated, Dad or Father. And if you got a bad relationship with your earthly father, then it has nothing to do with the heavenly father. Uh, most of our earthly fathers do not treat us the way God the Father wants us to be treated. But that's why he uses himself as a model as a loving God, as a loving Father, as a provider, as a protector. He says, that's what I want you to focus on because I've got promises in the Word of God that say I'll live up to my Word. God has never made a promise too good to be true. So uh, this word, I'm a Father, it, it is a phrase that expresses intimacy. Uh, God's intimacy for His children so that they can enjoy Him. See, we have a unique situation. Uh, when it comes to God, we should fear Him and yet not be afraid. We should fear him, that means respect him, and yet not be afraid because he's our father. He has our best interests at heart, regardless of what we're going through. If you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Whatever you're going through, you say, Lord, why is it taking so long for you to get this off of me? You say, God says, I still got you, though. See, I still got you. Whatever you're going through, it won't be more than you can bear. The question is, how much of my word do you know and you believe? I believe it said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there's no test taking you. But such as is coming to man. But God who is faithful will not allow you to be tested beyond that ye are able. Once again, get a double portion when you come to Sunday school. We were talking about that a little bit in Sunday school. See, a, a lot of times when people are taken to the brink of suicide, God has allowed that. Not saying that I can't go there and you can't go there. But he will allow us to go to a point of desperation so we can make a choice. Are you going to trust me or are you going to try to do it yourself? Are you willing to trust me? I, I've allowed you to come to this point. See, God will take us to strange places we never thought of just to put us in a position where we can trust him. And many times God will allow us to be brought to a desperate situation so we can finally, fully surrender to his will and to his way. And so that's what he wants us to understand about this. And, and once we do that, when we begin to pray to the Father, to Allah, we can pray in confidence, which we always talk about it. Hebrews 4.16, where it says, let us come boldly with confidence that we may obtain grace and mercy. Now, now, how can you do that? Staying focused on God. See, the more confidence you have in God, the more courage you have on man in circumstances. So you have to keep your life simple. We complicate life. We complicate faith. It's really simple. That's why God is asking us to keep a mindset of a child, to, to keep a childlike faith. Just trust me. Because I've already told you that I love you and I'm going to provide for you. I've already taken care of the greater thing for you, eternity. It stands to reason I can take care of the things that happen to you in time. But I'm shaping you and molding you. We forget the process. We go from, 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 from being saved uh, and God has taken us through the wilderness to develop us. And then finally he takes us to our destiny. That's deliverance, that's development, then that's destiny. Deliverance, then that's development in the wilderness, and then there's destiny. But it's all in God's time not on our own. So we're talking about a God that we begin to see in different kinds of light. You know, God has many names in the Bible. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Roha, my shepherd. Uh, Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Shema, the God is present. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. God, my healer. So God says, I can heal whatever pain that you have. But if you don't allow God to heal you, you know what you will do? You will bleed on everybody that did not touch you. You go throughout life in an attitude of misery. You, you're raining on everybody's parade and God is trying to teach you how to grow up and learn how to dance in the rain. It doesn't have anything to do with the stars.
storm does it. I'm trying to show you how to dance in the rain. And when you do that, that's what draws others to me. That's how you're able to be a good disciple. But that's all because God has become our Father. Our Father. Just think about that. The God of the universe is our Father. And He longs to be a blessing to His children. So, so this message that uh, Jesus came with was a message about His awesome Father. A message about the family that you're now in. And a message about our future. Well, what am I talking about here? Well, when God is talking about this message that He's our Father, remember the prodigal son who wanted his, 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 his inheritance before it was time. And then he tried to do it on his own and he came back and where was the father that waiting for him to come back home? God is waiting for you too, if you've strayed away from him. I know during this pandemic time, most Christians have strayed away from God. I didn't say a few Christians. Most Christians have strayed away from God. But God said, remember my prophets, Matthew 11, 28, 30. He said, yeah, come in unto me all you that are weary and heavy laden. He said, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. I'll take away that stress from you. I, I, I'll show you how to rest on my promises. I'll show you how to stand in the faith. I'll remind you what faith really means. Faith really means delivered confidence in the character of God. And so God says, once you do that, you can be a good family member. And how do you do that? Verse 6 makes it abundantly clear. It says, now, when we come together, uh, you'll be crying this in your heart. You'll cry out to the Father, Abba, Father. Verse uh, 34 and 4 of Psalm, he says, I cried unto the Lord, and he delivered me from all my fears. I cried unto the Lord, and he delivered me from all my fears. This is how you unwrap the meaning of heaven's gift. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was on the rescue mission. He was not just the babe in the manger. Uh, he was making a way out of nowhere. So when we come to see what he came to provide, then our lives will improve exponentially because God says you cannot fathom in your mind the blessings that I have in store for you. So God in his grace and his mercy continues to provide for us. He is opening red seas on a daily basis. But God is saying if you choose the world's way, then your future, your destiny won't be all that I designed it to be. And finally we see he has a message about our future. A message about our future. Well, what does God want to do with the future that he's given us? You know, it says in Jeremiah 29, he says, I know the future for you, and it's not to harm you, but to bless you. So in verse 37, verse 7, uh, 4 and 7, it says, therefore, you are no longer a slave. You don't have to be burdened down by sin anymore, dominated by sin anymore, circumstances. It says, but you're a son now. Remember who you are. Remember your identity in Christ, and if a son, guess what? You also have an inheritance as well. You have an inheritance through Jesus Christ. That's your Merry Christmas right there. Every day, God says he's already given us everything in spiritual places. But you know what you do? As you grow up spiritually, you're able to draw down those things from heaven that God has already prepared for you. That's your grace job. But if you never mature in God's word, if you keep going back, if you keep spiritually moonwalking, you can't receive what God has in store for you. And so we see down here this message that God has for us is an awesome message about our future. If you have no uh, confidence, uh, you know, in the future, you have, if you have no power in the present. So God is making it clear here. Uh, we think that our way is the best way. But God says it's my way or no way. God says in light of that, remember, underline the word heirs. You are heirs of God. Don't try to get it too soon before it's your time because I have to develop you for the capacity for what I've already uh, created for you. We are to be reminded we are his heirs. What belongs to our Father belongs to us as well. What belongs to our Father belongs to us as well. And so, because we are heirs of this great estate that God has in store for us, he says now, I need you to remain spiritually minded. And that's what we were trying to convey on last uh, Sunday in our uh, Christmas brunch. We wanted to thank you for staying spiritually minded. It's easy to get bogged down by circumstances of life. Uh, when life throws you a curve, it looks like you just can't get ahead. Or you're so distracted by the cares of the world. But you chose to stay spiritually connected. And because of that, God is still blessing you right now. He has greater things in store for you. Not just to be blessed, but to become a blessing. That's what's important. Because we know that uh, he has resources that have no end. Philippians 4.19 my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. 
You have to draw these blessings down from heaven as you mature in God's word. And that's what God wants us to remember on an awesome day like today and an awesome season in which we're in. We will, we will inherit everything that he has set aside for us if we stay on the path that he has lighted the way for us in the midst of that. So it doesn't matter, but you have to make a decision if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. If you're tired of the heartache, if you've been encountering off and on of pain, God says, I will exchange my joy for your pain, but you have to stay close to me. So God is reaching out to you today as I close right now, uh, during this Christmas season. He says, I want you to enjoy the season, I want you to enjoy the festivities, but I don't ever want you to forget the real meaning of Christmas. Christmas was a rescue mission. And I love you so much, I sent a message through my son, Jesus Christ. Just think about it. This indescribable gift that we've been talking about. You ought to get excited when you hear the name Jesus, when you think about what he's already done for you. The mere fact that he personally thought about you and made provision for you and me just ought to make you want to bless his holy name. And what the psalmist says in Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall forever be in my mouth. But it should be in your countenance. It should be in your lifestyle on a daily basis. Worship is not an event. Worship is a lifestyle. Uh, you don't wait for Christmas and read about it and look to about how the angels got up in the sky and they were, 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 were having a parade and singing praises to the Lord. We should be singing praises to God on a daily basis through our lifestyle, through our walk. God says, is there something missing? If there's something missing, I have something to put under your tree. The tree of your soul. It talks about the life that God wants to give you. See, eternal life is more than just duration. It is a quality of life. How is your quality of life in Christ? Some of us have received the gift, but we seem like we're not really grateful for what God has already given us. God is saying that if you have something that God has given to you, have you shown your gratitude? Have you shown it by making yourself available to him? Have you shown it by making yourself available to people? Do you know we are here to add value to other people, not just to ourselves? Let me say that again. We are here to add value to other people. Not just to ourselves. And a lot of people, they pass up worship on the way to service. You know, they pass up service on the way to worship. And God is saying, you know, I, I, I'm trying to bless you. I sent people your way so that you can show them that you appreciate what I've done for you. But you're so busy trying to get to church to try to complete your to-do list, you forgot to serve that person. So God wants us to be mindful of that during this time because when we open up that gift, God has things for us that we could not even fathom that he would give to us because we're so undeserving. Our God is an awesome God, but there are some things he not only wants to unwrap for you through his son Jesus Christ, there are some things he wants to unwrap in your life that are found in this word. Now is the time to make that decision. The most important thing I want to unwrap is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The time to do that is right now. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you once again with bowed heads and our hearts. As we come closer and closer to this Christmas day. But in the midst of this Christmas season, help us to understand that your son is Christmas, oh God, and that he has done more for us than we could ever do for ourselves. And for those that feel like this is just a depressing time, I, I just can't seem to get above my circumstances or my emotions, reminding the Father God, you've already done the most for them, and you want to bless them where they are right now. Yeah. There's nothing about getting ready to come to you. The time to come is right now, God. Bless them, the Father God, just as you bless me, you bless all of us that are here today. Let them know that your love never changes, it is everlasting, and it is unending. We thank you, the Father God, for your indescribable gift, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. In the sweet and strong name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.